Hello everyone. So another meeting with lectures from students and today we have five such lectures. Um, so let's start with Eldad. Eldad, the stage is yours. Thank you, Miki. Hello everyone. Uh, so today I will present the paper Enhancing Diffusion-Based Immunosynthesis with robust classifier guidance. My name is Eldad Matmon. This is the paper by Bajat Kawa, Roy Gantz and Miki Eldad, our professor. So we'll go over the introduction first. Then we show the guidance in the DPM, afterwards the limitations uh, of this approach, the solution the paper gave, and the results, and finally we could conclude the paper. So why do we need guidance? We've seen this already before in a few student lectures. We will just name a few reasons why we want to have guidance in our generation process. So specifically, we can, uh, for example, generate from specific class. As we can see here on the right side, we can generate images of airplanes, cars, dogs, etc. We can also generate from a given text. So for example, if we have a caption here and we want to generate image from that caption, we can um, guide the diffusion process or the generation process using the caption. And we can also generate from a specific style. So for example, we can guide uh, the generation process to give us an image that is in the style of Van Gogh, for example, as we can see here. And there are many more applications of guidance. This is just the name of you. So there are two types of main uh, guidance. So, so we have classifier guidance, which is guiding the generation process explicitly using a classifier. And there is classifier free guidance, which is guiding the generation process implicitly. For example, I can train a conditional denoiser, condition on the class label, and then I can uh, input this class label during the generation process. So I don't need explicit uh, classifier for the guidance. And today our focus will be specifically classifier guidance. So we are uh, explicitly using a classifier to guide the generation process. Now, the, the paper robust classifier guidance is an improvement upon existing method. So we will revisit the method to fully understand it and the improvement. In class, we've seen for ALD, for Anilda Javan Dynamics, for example, if you want to sample from the distribution of X given a class C, this is the iterative equation. This is the score function given a log of P of X given C. And what can we do with this expression? We can do base rule to obtain the two terms. We can plug it back in to get the corrected ALD iterative equation. And the guidance, the guidance is via this gradient of a classifier. This is a classifier because it's the probability of class C given a noisy image XK. So this is how we can guide in the ALD. We can guide the sampling process. We have seen this already in class. But now we can ask ourselves in DDPM, how can we uh, how can we implement such guidance? Let us uh, remember the algorithm for diffusion sampling for diffusion models. So it, we model the backward distribution as a Gaussian. So at each time step, we predict mu and sigma, which are the parameters of this uh, Gaussian distribution using a neural network. And then we sample from it to obtain x t minus 1. We do it iteratively until we converge to x0, which is the clean image. So if we look at this algorithm, we need to ask ourselves, how can we implement guidance? And this is what we will answer next. So a uh, heavily cited paper uh, was Diffusion Models with Kant. This is not the first uh, paper that introduced uh, classifier guidance, but it explained in the paper that you can write the conditional backwards distribution. This is condition uh, Y. You can write it as some constant Z times the unconditional backwards distribution times our classifier. What we did with the ALD using the base rule was fairly simple. This requires proof. Now, for the sake of completeness, I put the proof in the slide. I was going to go over it, but in the for times, we will skip it. Um, maybe I will give just the, the overview of the, the proof. So we will start by defining a process Q hat. Q hat would be conditional Markovian noise in process similar to Q. And then we define the following four definitions. For example, we define that the probability of x0 of q hat will be identical to the probability of q of x of x0. Sorry. So we define four uh, definitions, and then we obtain some properties, which I will not go over in the sake of time. Not very, not very complicated, very nice, but and eventually they show that you can write the conditional backwards distribution uh, as follows, as a constant z times the unconditional times a classifier. Now, what can we do with this? We can model this 
uh, using the parameters p of theta and p of e. This will be a classifier, and this will be our diffusion models that we already have, the backwards diffusion models. If we take the log, we get the sum uh, expression, the sum of those. So this was our expression. If we, we put the log, we can get the, the sum of terms. And let's look at it one by one. So this p of xt given xt plus 1 is the backwards process, which we have already seen in DDPM. We model it as Gaussian. And we learn mu, mu of theta. And sigma we set as a, as a scalar, uh, depending on the noise levels. So we know this distribution. This p of y given xt is a classifier. So what can we do in this expression? Simply, we can do a first order Taylor expansion around xt equals mu. The mean of the image will be mu, so we do a Taylor expansion. So this is the constant. This is the classifier of xt at xt equals mu, plus the first order is xt minus mu times the gradient of log of this uh, classifier of y given xt, the noise image. We can further simplify this if we take this term and call it g. So we have that this term is xt minus mu times g plus some constant c1, which is this constant. So we know the two terms. We know their distribution. We can plug it in. So plugging the, the Gaussian distribution with mean mu and sigma will obtain this term because we take the log, so minus 1 half this expression. And we've seen already that we can do a Taylor expansion to this expression to obtain xt minus mu times g. And we collect all the constant terms. Now we can further take this, this expression and plug it back in here, plus add a correcting term because here we need to correct over sigma one, sigma minus one. So we can plug in xt minus mu times g here, but add a constant to correct the term. Now, if we look at this expression, this expression is the log of the probability of the conditional backwards distribution. This is very much reminding of a Gaussian with a constant. So we can write it as log of p of z plus some constant c3, where pz is a Gaussian distribution, but not with mu and sigma, but with a shifted mean, mu plus sigma j. So this is the change that we have. And if we want to sample from this distribution, this is the sample we saw in DDPM, which z here will be this Gaussian distribution. And the paper also added a scaling term s, just to sharpen the distribution. We've already seen this. Uh, to make uh, the class more, more uh, the probability more sharp. And we will see the effect of S later. Let's recall, so guidance in the ALD process was done by this form, and this is the guidance in the DPM. As I said, S sharpens the distribution. So if this was the original DDPM algorithm, the only change that we need to make here is simply shifting the mean of the Gaussian which we sample from. So this is the shift of the mean, and this is the gradient of the classifier. And again, the classifier is conditioned on xt. xt is a noisy image. So it's a classifier that knows how to predict class label given a noisy image. OK, so let's see some results of this algorithm. Suppose we want to uh, produce images of corgi dogs, and we have eight images on the left and eight images on the right. We can immediately see that the images on the right are much more precise, much more of a corgi dog. And the images on the left are very um, not very much of dogs. So we have images that are somewhat unclear even and don't have any image of a dog. So we can think that the right images are given from classifier guidance, and the images on the left are just without classifier guidance. However, the images, both of the batches of the images, the left and right, are with classifier guidance. However, the only change is the scale level. So here is the scale equal one. Here is the scale equals 10. Now we can see three things. One, as we add the scale, we get much more precise images. Okay, So the images of a dog here is much more precise than the dog uh, supposing this image. And the second thing we can notice is that as we scale up S, we get much more precise, but much less diverse images. So there is a trade-off. We get much higher quality images but they are less diverse. Everything here is the shape of a dog. Even the grass here attempts to be in all of the images, so much less diverse images. And the third thing is, when we can look at these images on the left and say, we have a classifier guidance, so why doesn't it guide well the process? I mean, we have images here that can barely even uh, show a dog. 
Okay, so this is what I've said, precision versus recall is a trade-off. Again, if we scale up S and other examples, let's look at this butterfly, for example. As, this, as we scale S, we can see the image gets much more precise, much more uh, a defined image of a butterfly, um, as well as the husky dog and other uh, images. So why is it that even with the low scale, the guidance is not producing desirable class images? We can look at the gradients of the images with respect to the class label. So we have uh, four images of different classes, and we have their gradients at times equals zero and times equal 300. T equals zero is a clean image, and T equals 300 is a noisy version of the image. And we can see that the gradients of the, of the image with respect to the class label is not very well defined on the object. The, the, the gradients are not very well localized. If we look here at t equals 300, if we take the derivative of the classifier with respect to the class label of a squirrel, it gives emphasis to certain regions of the image that are not even relevant to the squirrel itself. So something is not quite robust in this in the sense of the gradients. The gradients are not very well perceptualized. They don't, uh, they don't form to the object. Furthermore, the papers show that if I have a classifier, I can change its gradients arbitrarily and obtain the same cost entropy loss and the same accuracy, which means if I have a, a, a classifier with the same accuracy, the gradients do, don't really uh, give me any input about uh, how well it defines on the objects or any, any robustness to it. Another nice thing that can be seen in a different uh, area is, for example, in uh, vision transformers, we can look at the classifier using vision transformers. And for example, let's look at this upper left image of a chestnut. We can see, for example, that the, uh, the classifier was 100% confident that this image is chestnut. However, if we look at the attention level and what the classifier pay attention to, very little to do with the object itself. The same with the bullfrog, we can see that the classifier paid very little attention to the object. So the gradients of the classifier cannot be trusted. This is what is called spurious cues, and uh, this means that the classifier is a shortcut or irrelevant background for classification. And the reason why it happens, the paper gave the reason uh, from a paper, previous paper, Shamir 2021, called the dimpled manifold effect. Suppose I have a classifier and I want to classify between the red and the blue classes. The red and the blue classes sit on a manifold on the green manifold that we see here. And the decision boundary is on the gray. As we train the classifier, we get an inwards pressure, meaning the decision boundary will come very close to the manifold itself. So when I take the gradients of a class with respect, the image with respect to the class, I will leave the manifold and get misclassified, even with a very small perturbation of noise. That's why usually the gradients of an image with respect to a class are, are noisy. So this gives mostly inward pressure, as I said, and we want to mitigate it. We want to make the, the gradients much more aligned with the manifold and not skip away from the manifold itself, giving us uh, unrealistic images. So how can we do it? We can add something that is counter force. We can add a repelling force using a gradient. So we can train with adversarial examples, we can take a classifier and train with adversarial examples to make it more robust. This robustness will give a repelling force to the decision boundary, make it, making it further away from the manifold. And now when we take the gradients of an image with respect to a class, the gradients will lie on the manifold, giving us much more perceptually aligned gradients. If we look at, so we've seen the second row. Now let's look at the third row of the robust classifier. Now, let me just mention the second row is also somewhat robust because again, the classifier here was trained on noisy images. However, the third row was the classifier trained on adversarial attacks. And as we can see, for example, for T equals 300, the squirrel, the gradients are much more aligned with the object itself, meaning the gradients are much more uh, perceptually aligned with what we think is the object, which is very important. This is what is called PAG, perceptually aligned gradients. And from the paper, uh, robustness may be at odds with accuracy, they stated that they observed that the gradients are significantly more human aligned for adversarial network. In contrast, for standard networks, they appear very noisy. So we want a perceptually a relevant features. So this is what I said. 
Okay, let's see again some result of the gradients. So this is a very uh, a lot of information here in the in the images, but what are we trying to do? So we take the gradients of an image with respect to a class. This tells the algorithm how to change the image so as to maximize the probability of that class. So to see this simply, let's look at this tennis balls. And we can take the derivative of each image here. We have four images. We can take the derivative of each image with respect to any class. So let's take a look at the original tennis ball and take the derivative with respect to the same class, the class of tennis balls. That means we want to maximize its probability. In the vanilla classifier, we can see that the gradients are not localized well on the tennis ball themselves, but rather they look at all over the image. However, when we look at the robust model, we can see that the gradients are much more confined to the tennis ball themselves, meaning this is what you need to change in order to make the class much more of a tennis ball, which is much more perceptually aligned with what we think is a tennis ball. And again, for uh, different classes, we can also take the image of a tennis ball and say, how should we change it to make it more of a hyena, for example, and we can see here gradients that are very rem reminding us of a hyena. So we can see that the robust classifier gives much better gradients than the vanilla classifier. And again, uh, samples uh, from the same seed, we can see the actual evolution of the image generation with vanilla versus the robust one. And you can see this is much more perceptually aligned and much more beautiful uh, looking uh, hamburger and also the dog. However, not all the examples uh, of the robust are appealing. Some handful of examples, for example, if we look at this bathtub on the right side, the vanilla, some people will argue that it produces better results in the terms of uh, contrast and lighting. Uh, so not all the images from the robust are uh, higher quality. So we need to uh, evaluate this. How do we evaluate? We have 1,000 uh, classes of uh, ImageNet, for example, and we can take we can generate 50 images per class. So for the vanilla and the robust, we have 50,000 images and we can calculate the metric. So let's look at the precision, for example. We can see that compared to the vanilla, the precision of the robust model is higher, which we've seen already, uh, for example, in the Corgi dogs. We can see that the FID is lower. However, the recall drops from unguided to vanilla to robust. So this is maybe a general phenomenon and not only from vanilla to robust, not only using the robust classifier, but also, for example, the vanilla classifier, when we scale S up, we also got, we saw a decrease in the recall. So it's not only vanilla versus robust, it's also the vanilla itself with a changing scale in S. So recall also decreases when S is large, and we've seen that. Furthermore, we, can, we have images, so we can do human evaluations. We can take for an average uh, 25 evaluators per pair. What, what do I mean by pair? We have two pairs of images. One was generated by the robust, one was generated by the vanilla, uh, with the vanilla guidance. And we tell the people, the people which image is more realistic, which is more aligned with the description. For example, Doberman, and let them choose. So we can see uh, the percentage of people chose robust over vanilla is significantly higher. How much significant? So in this research that they've done, uh, totaling around 5,000 individual answers, it was uh, significant levels of over 95%, which is to say the robust model gives much more desirable results. Uh, this is the threshold. So the threshold I will explain uh, shortly. So in order for an image to be preferable, it needs to be chosen more than the threshold. So for example, if I have 100 people chosen between the two images, I, for an image to be uh, considered above threshold 50, to be considered uh, better, more than 50 people need to choose it. Okay? So this is a change in, of a threshold. And again, if you do uh, the math here, it gives significance levels of over 95%, which is uh, obviously improvement. So we'll conclude this uh, presentation. So we saw uh, explore the guidance in DDPM, okay? and saw how we can implement it. We also saw the limitations of the naive approach, just adding the regular classifier. And we introduced the solution that was done by, by the paper, which is to train it with adversarial examples, thus making more robust gradients, more perceptually aligned gradients. And we also assessed the solution and qualitatively, qualitatively and quantitatively. So future work can be done implementing a robust classifier beyond diffusion models, for example, again, we can extend the method to unlabeled data, 
or seek better sources of perceptual ingredients to improve the generation process. Maybe a further research idea is maybe to integrate attention-based algorithm, so potentially to steer the diffusion more effectively, because maybe the diffusion model should not waste its energy to produce better background, but rather produce uh, better looking images and the subjects in the image. So this can be a very interesting way of research. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, okay. I have a short question. Uh -huh. um, do you think you can combine this with uh, uh, classifier free guidance somehow? To combine classifier guidance with classifier free guidance? No, the robustness with classifier free guidance. Classifier free guidance is to train the, the diffusion uh, process with the class label. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, actually, it, it can be an idea. Actually, it can be an idea. But okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Interesting. Thank you very much, Eldad. Uh, Sanket, you are next. Okay. Please share your slides. Yes. Um, um, do you see my screen? Yes. But please go to the beginning. Wonderful. Yes. The stage is your Sanket. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this paper called uh, Deep Equilibrium Approaches to Diffusion Models. It's from uh, people in Carnegie Mellon, Zico Coulter being a prominent one. So um, so I'll, I'll first give a TLDR, so quickly just uh, one line summary, and then I will go in, in depth about, about different things that are involved in the paper. So, so the, the TLDR of the paper is it's an acceleration scheme uh, for uh, for diffusion model um, sampling. So they use uh, this thing called deep equilibrium models to accelerate the sampling procedure of diffusion models. Um, so they say that this accelerated sampling procedure works and it and it enables new applications such as model inversion. Um, so this was like a paper from twenty two. So it's a it's a bit old, I would say, but yeah. So this this is the basic basic thing that they contribute, um, the, the an accelerated procedure for sampling. So so let's uh, let's see what the equilib deep equilibrium models are. So basically, these are uh, layers uh, which can solve a fixed point iteration. So let's say you have an input, um, and you have a layer which essentially states it makes this statement, right? Do you have some uh, nonlinear function f? Which, when applying, uh, if if it applies um, um, this, if you apply this function to f, uh, sorry, if if you apply the function f to z and x, you're gonna get z. So this is a fixed point iteration, and uh, once uh, once you solve, once you optimize this uh, f to produce a uh, a z which satisfies this equation given x, this is your output, right? So this is. Uh, this is a fixed point layer. So it takes in X, it's a black box. Uh, this black box obeys certain condition called F of ZX equal to Z. And then it outputs a Z which satisfies this condition. So, so how do you solve such a fixed point iteration? These are basically, you can just say that G theta is just Z minus uh, F theta of uh, ZX and basically find the minima of this uh, G theta square, for example. So these are like very common. Uh, for example, if you think of any second order optimization algorithm, um, they are essentially solving gradient equal to zero, right? You have some, you want to minimize some objective function and you want to solve gradient equal to zero. So this is a fixed point iteration. You, uh, you start, uh, it's, so you, there are many, any second order uh, method can be used uh, to solve this uh, problem. And one of one such method is uh, quasi-Newton. Uh, essentially it's a, uh, um, it's Newton's method with approximated Jacobian. So, so there's a procedure you can start with some guess of z, uh, then you iter then you find um, then you update it based on if, if it's uh, uh, by solving um, this g x equal to zero, and you keep iterating. So there you can think of it as some off the shelf solver which can solve fixed point iterations for you. It doesn't you don't need to uh, it's black box because you don't need access to uh, what's going on inside us. Um, 
So how do you differentiate? So if you want to cast it as a block, uh, you want to differentiate through it. So how do you differentiate through it? There is, um, so you can use this trick called uh, implicit differentiation. So basically when you have a function, which is uh, g of x, z comma x equal to zero, um, and you want to get the gradient of, let's say, d, dz by dx or dz by d theta in this case, um, you can use the implicit function theorem to get the gradient. So for example, here, uh, I wanted to compute dz by d theta. So we take dg by dz, uh, it's it's equal to dz by d, dg by dz, uh, Jacobian inverse or uh, dg by d theta. So similarly, if you want a gradient with respect to x, just place, replace theta and x, you get the same, same thing. Um, so this is uh, this is a useful layer. So because now you think about if what what is happening here is that you you have a block which can take in x and it produces some z and it's some nonlinear transformation and this nonlinear transformation is an output of an optimization iteration like a output of a process which solves an optimization problem. So yeah, uh, so some things to note is that it can be thought of as uh, an infinite depth network because um, the mapping between x to z requires an arbitrarily um, arbitrary number of map, uh, number of applications of z sorry of f theta so it can be thought of as uh, infinite depth networks they are they are useful and notice one thing to notice is that when we backprop uh, we don't necessarily we don't uh, here you don't see anything about um, uh, back uh, about the solver that you're using so the backprop is kind of, is agnostic to the root finding solver you can choose uh, the best root finding solver you can, and then you apply this gradient uh, in the backward, and 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 you can get gradients with respect to theta. So you can train these models. They are, these are layers that can be trained. So uh, these are numerically unstable, but they are shown to be like useful in many uh, vision and uh, sequence modeling tasks. So basically, the TLD for the message in the slide is that you can you can cast layers as uh, fixed point iterations. And you can solve them. You can backprop through them. They are part of your deep learning pipeline. So, so now uh, I'll recall what uh, deep uh, denoising diffusion implicit models are, DDIM. So let's recall DDPM. Uh, we have um, we have a clean image. Um, we are progressively adding noise to it. Uh, it's a and we are trying to estimate the. We, so we are interested in estimating p of x zero. And so we created this Markov chain of p of x1, uh, x2, and x3 with increasingly adding, uh, with increasing amount of noise. And we are modeling uh, the reverse chain. Um, and uh, so, and this is DDPM. And this is, for example, uh, what you train with, uh, with a score matching loss or, or a denoiser. So uh, in DDIM, if you remember from the lectures, we said that um, they break this Markovian structure, they introduce um, this link from x0 to everywhere uh, in the graph. So you're not, the, the following node is not just depending on um, on, on the previous node, but also on x0. So it uh, it is not Markovian. So, but, uh, but the cool thing is that you can define a generalized sampling process like this. So this kind of encapsulates everything. You have xt minus one written in terms of xt and uh, and a sigma z, sigma theta, which is a denoiser. So you can, you can write this process. Uh, you can write it in this form. And uh, some useful thing to note is that if you want DDPM, you can just set uh, sigma t to a certain value. So if you set in this expression, if you set uh, sigma t to be that, you get DDPM. And if you set sigma t to be zero, you get DDIM. So basically, the training procedure is the same. You train the same denoiser. First, you define a forward chain uh, of uh, um, of uh, additive, uh, increasingly additive noise, and you train denoisers uh, conditioned on time. And you, once you, uh, once you, once you get your denoisers, you can just apply this process depending on how you choose your sigma, uh, and this will give you either DDPM or DDIM. So um, the key thing is that if you want to train a DDIM model, you don't need to train your denoisers. You can just use the ones from DDPM. So. So, and, the, and another useful thing is that the sampling process, since notice that the sigma t is zero, which is the only source of randomness uh, in, the, in the following iterations, the sampling process is deterministic up to the first uh, realization of noise. Um, so, and it is, it is observed that DDIM results in uh, 
much efficient sampling, like it results in far less iterations than DDPM. So DDPM, for example, uh, requires, um, let's say 1000 iterations or 500 to 1000 iterations to converge. Uh, DDIM requires, let's say 25 to 50 from the papers. So it's an order of magnitude difference. So, um, so the bottom line is that you can, you can train your denoisers the way you typically do with score matching loss, and then you can update your sampling procedure to either produce a DDIM or DDPM, and DDIM is a more efficient version, and it's also a deterministic version. So in this paper, what uh, the primary contribution, actually they also show how to convert um, DDPM, but it is, uh, but I won't go into that. So the key, uh, the key contribution is that they want to optimize DDIM inference using uh, a deep equilibrium model. So if you remember from the previous slide, the DDIM sampling procedure is like that. You have an expression xt minus one. It is depending on xt and epsilon t. Uh, epsilon t is your noise prediction when you look at xt, and uh, xt is the noise itself. Um, so you can you can split this term into uh, xt and sigma t. Uh, C one is some constant which represents the coefficient of sigma t, and you can uh, you can write any um, uh, any time in the future as uh, as a composition of everything in the past. So in some sense, if you think of it as a, uh, if you if you put, if you lay out x t minus one and so on up to x zero in a, in a matrix, um, you're multiplying with a lower triangular matrix um, in order to produce, uh, um, produce more and more samples. For example, x t minus one depends only on x t, but you can write x t minus k to be depending on everything that precedes it. So um, this is important because, um, in, in this case, you can think of x t minus k to be dependent on the denoiser outputs of everything, uh, all the denoiser outputs before. So, so you can you can write it as a system system of equations. Define some h. You know, h is a uh, h. Uh, I mean, it's a bit uh, annoying to write it like this, but it's uh, h is not time invariant because your function, uh, your h accepts time as input, so it's time dependent. Uh, you can write x of h x t uh, x t as x t minus one, um, it, uh, h of x t minus one and x t as which gives you x t minus two and so on. It's basically writing the above equation, uh, the above equation in in just a system of equations form. So where h is um, h encapsulates everything that goes on in uh, in in that equation. It takes in you you, you provide an x. Uh, xt and it produces you it first gets converted into sigma t which sigma of xt which is a prediction and you add it to the previous x which is uh, and and therefore you get xt minus 1 so similarly for xt minus uh, 2 you um you you do this you do the same procedure for xt minus you essentially replicate the equation the third equation and i can't access my cursor sorry um so I, it's the third equation written there so is what you can what you can uh, write and this is what gives you xt minus two and so on. So you can think of this system of equations as uh, a single function and let's call it h tilde, uh, which accepts an xt and, and it produces you um, a sequence, a sequence of x zero to xt minus one. And you can think of it as, uh, you can interpret this thing as a sequence which takes in x t minus x zero to x t minus one and it produces you um, an equal dimensional output. So this is, uh, you can interpret this thing as a fixed point. Uh, so this is the key takeaway of the paper. So you can, uh, sorry. Um, so you can interpret the system of equations as a fixed point iteration where, um, you sample all the times at once in parallel. So you initialize your x0 with noise to start with, uh, x0 to xt with noise. Then you apply one step of denoising by providing the correct time to the denoiser as input. So you've you've gotten you got an estimate of uh, of the respective next time steps for all of them together. Then uh, then you create uh, so we get we got like, like an estimate of sigma sigma theta. Of of uh, of x for all the time steps together, then uh, you apply um, you apply this third equation to get to the corresponding x t from sigma. Now, um, so notice that you you can apply this step for all of them in parallel. Then 
so you, you evaluate multiple denoisers at the, all the time steps, and then you compose these multiple denoiser outputs into, into the corresponding axis, and you keep doing it uh, until the fixed point iteration is satisfied, until the axis no longer update. So when you do that, you essentially are recovering the entire uh, entire diffusion process without sequentially sampling them. Yeah, ideally, what you have to do in this set of equations is you, you have to place xt, then you get xt minus one, then you take xt minus one and go to the next step. But you don't do that. You just take uh, initial noise realization, um, apply apply all the denoisers with all the time steps to it. You get an output and you ask this output to be the same as input. Only then you stop. So because uh, when this fixed point iteration is met, it means that the denoiser can no longer denoise this sample, and it is um, it it is saying so for all of them together, uh, for for all the time steps together. Then it means that it converged. So it is useful to know that you can take an off-the-shelf DDPM model, uh, which is sigma theta, right? The sigma theta is your off-the-shelf DDPM model, and you can apply this procedure post hoc, no retraining required, and uh, sampling in parallel is trivially parallelizable in the sense you can just have uh, you can just have all you need is to evaluate the noiser uh, many many times so you can do so you can do so by parallelizing your model across GPUs um, simple to do in Torch and uh, ensuring we need to ensure that each point has a meaning right okay you denoised a certain noise sample with a given time but it has to follow the DDIM structure so you need to ensure that uh, once you denoise you're adding, uh, you're adding XTs appropriately. So you're applying this lower triangular structure after you do the denoising. So this is crucial, but it's also parallelizable because you don't need to do it in sequence. It's a matrix multiplication, so it's fully parallel. So, and you can use quasi-Newton to solve these fixed point iterations. Essentially, you have a function which takes an XT and it produces you an X0 to XT minus one, which satisfies this, this equation. And we know that once you satisfy this equation, uh, you're essentially producing the DDIM process because that's how you casted this uh, structure. So uh, at least if you only care about sampling, you don't need to differentiate through the solver. Actually, you don't need the thing I explained before about implicit uh, differentiation that, that is required later. Uh, but the caveat here is that it requires many, many denoiser evaluations. It's, it's true that they're not sequential, but you're evaluating the denoiser. Like if you count flops, probably, you'll, you'll probably be costing the same just that these, uh, these flops are executed in parallel so you don't suffer in time. This is the key like, takeaway. It's not truly reducing time. You're just able to parallelize better. Um, you're not reducing the number of, uh, number of operations. Um, so some results. So using this procedure, for example, if you look at DDPM, um, it requires 1,000 iteration on Cypher 10 to reach an FID of, let's say, 3.17, and it take, took like 24 seconds. Uh, and similar, but in DDP in DDIM, you're able to do the same with uh, if you if you do DDIM for thousand iterations, um, it requires slightly lesser time because you're not adding noise, so you save some operations. Uh, it, it it achieves about this, it reaches about the same accuracy, uh, and uh, the same thing. But uh, with DDIM, it it is an order of magnitude like lower time. You're solving thousands of iterations, even thousands of iterations, since you're solving all of them in parallel. Since and Cypher 10 is small images, you can solve a lot of things in parallel. Uh, uh, you're saving an order of magnitude time while kind of keeping the FID similar. Uh, but let's say, I mean, the more realistic settings is when you want, let's say, high resolution images. Let's say you go, I think some of these are like relatively high resolutions, uh, like Celebay. Um, there, the margin decreases, like the margin you get based on DDIM decreases. And most notably, when you have this Elson bedroom and church, when you limit the number of time steps to be 25, you can see that DDPM didn't converge, like it has very high FIDs. Uh, and DDIM did converge with, uh, with a decent FID scores, and it's much faster. Uh, since you only evaluated 25 times, you're doing, you're essentially running denoiser for 25 times. That's it, when you do DDIM with 25 steps. So, but when you do uh, the one with, uh, with equilibrium models, you're you're incurring more more time because uh, because you're solving uh, this uh, quasi Newton method, which has more operations than just evaluating the denoisers. So you you need to solve uh, like a linear system and, and many more things inside, uh, which which require more time. So and and similarly, like you can convert this uh, 
the same procedure uh, that you have um, into a DDPM version where you inject noise every time. So essentially the bottom line is the same for for a same them for the same number of iterations. Uh, DDIM is uh, slightly worse than the uh, than um, than deep equilibrium models. Uh, if in the in the sense of fidelity, like you're getting worse images with DDIM, but it takes lesser time for the same number of iteration budget. But um, so this is like the summary of let's say the sampling results. So you have for the small iteration budget, DDIM is slower than DDIM, uh, native naive DDIM, DDIM inference. The benefit kicks in only when you have larger uh, larger iteration budgets, and almost always uh, DEM produces higher fidelity images than DDIM and DDPM for the same iteration budget. So if you're limited in time, um, then I mean it's uh, it's you can choose you can choose to use it. So but uh, so there is uh, but another problem that the um, such uh, such efficient sampling methods can tackle is something called as model inversion. Um, so the pro the problem is as follows: You're given a sample from real data. Can you identify the noise realization that produced it? Okay. So the naive approach. Let's say I have a DDIM sampler. How would I solve it? Let's say I have a sample x zero, and I want to understand where where it came from, which noise realization it came from. So you can apply this algorithm. You take an x zero from the data set. You have a sigma t with sigma theta, which is your noise, uh, your train denoising diffusion model, and you apply uh, this F is the application of one single DDIM iteration. You get the next sample T and you apply it in a loop. Finally, you get X0, which is a function of all the intermediate epsilon uh, epsilon theta outputs. And then you backprop, right? Then this is like trivial. You're just uh, doing it in a, in a loop and then you're backpropping through it. So uh, this is one way to do it. But since we saw... Uh, so this is back propagating in time, right? Essentially, you have twenty neural networks, uh, one stacked after the other, and you're back propagating through them to update your input realization, which is the noise, in order to find something. So it's um, so it can be expensive and slow and might not converge as well because the gradients, uh, because of the usual problems with uh, that you have with uh, with vanishing gradients, etc. So what they suggest is use implicit differentiation in, uh, instead because. Now you're decoupling the forward with the backward in the sense that your forward is using some other solver to solve this problem, and your backward is directly uh, going to the inputs, right? So you have such a such a such a fixed point iteration. You have x theta to t minus one produced in parallel by looking at x t. Now you can define this problem, like you can define x t star as the noise which minimizes this loss, right? So you're trying to find x t which minimizes which uh, which brings you an image which is closest to your target, right? Uh, by the way, this can be any any uh, inverse problem. This is just, you're trying to find your X0 can be available only in a projection, for example, and you're looking for a noise realization which produces you an image that whose projection matches your X0, right? You can put any forward model here instead of just asking the sample to be the same. So this is, I would say this is beyond just finding a noise realization. It's actually can solve inverse problems this way. So. Um, so uh, in order to update xt, you need a gradient of dl with respect to all the inputs, dx0 to xt. And you have a Jacobian of uh, g theta with respect to uh, x0 to xt. And you have a dh from x, uh, um, x0 to xt beyond d, d, dxt, right? So you can solve this. Uh, so let's say you can estimate all these quantities. The Jacobian is well estimated and so on. But it is uh, then this is the iteration. Essentially, you're given a noise realization. You're applying this DQ DDIM solver, which is essentially producing you a trajectory all at once uh, by solving by doing root solve root finding. Then uh, you have uh, you have your final output. You take that and you ask it to be close to the sample that you are given. So, which is your loss that you evaluate on it, like x uh, minimize the L two norm between x two x zero and x zero hat, and then you take a gradient uh, step and update your x zero. Sanket. Please yep. wrap it up. Okay. Okay. So basically, you can do. So something we would have to skip some things. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You no are problem. beyond the time. Yeah. Okay. So you need to do some numerical tricks to make it work. Actually, so I'm I'm gonna skip that because it's kind of not super interesting. I would say. Um. So and and it works better than uh, and it works better than using uh, 
better than the baseline algorithm, uh, inverting DDIM explicitly. And, and so extension that... will be discussed um, in another time. Okay. So okay, let, okay. let's stop here. Questions? Yeah. One question that we can afford. Yeah. Guys, anyone? Okay, so okay. thank you very much. What I would suggest is that we proceed with yet another presentation and then we go to a break. So our third speaker is Ofek. Ofek, please share your slides. No problem, one second. Mm -hmm. You're echoing. Um, is it better now? Slightly, yes. Um, if it's uh, an issue, tell me and I will switch to headphones, okay? Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Please tell, yes. Okay. Um, so, hi guys, my name is Ofek. Uh, I'll be presenting the paper Progressive Distillation for Fast Samplings of uh, Diffusion Models. Uh, written by Tim Salomons and Jonathan Ho from the Google Brain team. Uh, the paper was presented at ICLR 2022. Okay, so I will go over a quick introduction to the topic of the paper. I will uh, um, discuss some background uh, relevant for uh, the main method that is proposed, which is progressive distillation, an algorithm which they propose to shorten the sampling time needed. Uh, then I will go over a quick model parameterization that the authors proposed uh, that will that uh, makes sure the algorithm is sound. And then I will show some experiment and experiment results. Uh, if time permitting, I will discuss some uh, future work. Okay. Um, so uh, diffusion models, the the topic we've been discussing uh, all semester. Diffusion models are great for generative modeling. Uh, they've shown great success, uh, but a remaining downside of the uh, of their use is the slow sampling time. Uh, at the time of the paper, it was published, most models required uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of steps to achieve uh, state-of-the-art performance, and this cannot be, uh, this, the, the optimization scheme has not been discussed, the, the decreasing the sampling st uh, steps, because they, the sampling steps were, they have to be done sequentially, um, so it can't be paral parallelized, uh, much like other models today. Um, so the main contributions of this paper is a distillation algorithm. Um, that reduces the number of uh, steps needed for sampling. Uh, and they also uh, propose a new parameterization framework that allows the diffusion models uh, with uh, decreased sampling steps to be stable and um, that the, the math is still sound. Okay. So uh, I'll just go over a quick the, the ingredients we have in diffusion models. Um, we all, uh, when using, when talking about diffusion models, we have uh, uh, an intermediate noise images, like a set of noise images at given time steps. T. Uh, can you see my mouse? Okay. Uh, and the noise scheduling usually parameterized by alpha t, sometimes with sigma and beta, depends on the, the formulation. Uh, a quick reminder of DDIM, even though it was covered in earlier lectures. Um, uh, a DDIM similar to DDPM also has a forward and backward process, but the different the, the main change between the two um, formulations is that DDIM is non-Markovian, meaning that X zero always has an effect both in the forward and the backward process, um, basically. And the update we we'll proposed in the DDIM uh, paper was like so: to to go from X at, at uh, time t to time to t. Uh, to x t minus one, meaning we get closer to the original image, we perform the following update rule. Um, let's uh, go over quickly what some of these, uh, what all of these mean. We have uh, sigma t, which controls how much random noise is injected into the sampling process. Uh, x, it affects both the prediction of the denoiser and uh, the random variable epsilon t. We have uh, uh, x hat theta x t, which is the denoiser, uh, which given uh, uh, a noise image returns the the clean image x zero. Uh, we, we this is often uh, uh, you they use a neural network to to use to perform this denoising process. We have alpha t, which is a fixed hyperparameter, controls the ratio of how much image is induced in, is included in the next image and how much noise we're going to have at time step t. And we have epsilon t, which is a, a random uh, regular Gaussian, which we use to uh, introduce some sto stochasticity into the process. 
Um, a quick, uh, a very important uh, um, thing that they uh, mentioned in the DDIM paper is that when sigma t uh, is set to zero, the update rule is now set to be is, is deterministic and is set to be the following uh, update rule. When this, uh, when x theta hat is uh, the x zero, and this is the noise uh, at step t, this is uh, easy to see when you look at, uh, this is the noise image at, times, at time t, this is uh, x zero. When you when you subtract the two, you get the noise at step t, and you have some uh, hyperparameters which try to balance the noise at the next time step t minus one. Okay, and that was uh, the quick backbone we needed for the, the to understand the, the topics of the paper. And I will move forward to the progressive distillation algorithm. Um, first, what is distillation? Uh, model distillation is, is defined as the transferring of knowledge from a, a large model to a small one. Um, the ingredients for model distillations are usually a, a large teacher model, uh, which is some uh, uh, high parameterized uh, neural network that has uh, been already, it's already been trained, it has, uh, achieves good results, uh, but operating it is usually uh, computationally slow and very expensive. And we have a small, untrained, sometimes trained student model, which is uh, um, it has less parameters, it's faster and cheaper to use and uh, to deploy. Distillation trains the student model to mimic the teacher's predictions, uh, making the student almost as good as the teacher model, but more efficient. Meaning we don't train the student model to just be as the, the best it could be, we try to ha have it mimic the teacher result. Um, how will this be done in diffusion models? Uh, the, the question that uh, arises. Um, we can progressively and iteratively use a teacher model with some T uh, sampling steps, teach a student model with half the, the steps to be just as good. This can be done progressively and iter this can be done iteratively until we reach a, sam uh, a, a number of sampling steps that we are satisfied with. Intuitively, how does this work? We have, uh, uh, we, we can begin with a teacher model that has some uh, number of uh, T time steps. And each time we distill the teacher model that, uh, to a student model with, that, that has half the sampling steps but achieves uh, similar results. Meaning what we expect is we expect that the student model, for example, in this iteration to achieve in this, the denoising step, the same results that the teacher model would have achieved having done two sampling steps. And this can be done iteratively. Now we can set the new, student model to be the teacher model and distill again until we reach a model that can theoretically have one sampling step and be as good as the previous one. Okay, so more formally, how is this defined? Uh, we look at the standard diffusion training uh, algorithm for the original uh, diffusion model. We have uh, an input, uh, the da a data set D and a model uh, X theta XT. And while we're, we're not satisfied with the results, I mean, as long as the algorithm is not converged, we sample data, we sample a time step and some random noise. We create a noise image like so. Uh, we do, uh, we, uh, we're using the same uh, hyperparameters alpha, which are fixed in advance. We add some noise to the original noise image. Oh, sorry. And, and then we set that to be the target of our denoiser. And our denoiser receives uh, the, the, the noise image and tries to predict the original image, and then we try to uh, minimize the loss that is the Euclidean distance. Uh, could be uh, many different metrics, but here, a Euclidean distance between the, the, the predicted unnoised image using the denoiser and the original clean image. And then we perform some optimization. Okay, um, so how is the distillation, how does the distillation uh, algorithm look? Uh, it looks something like this. It may look scary, but it's not that different. I'll highlight the areas that are different. Um, the new um, parameters that are different is now in addition to uh, the data set D and the trained teacher model, we also uh, receive uh, a student steps N, which will be, which I will explain uh, how they are, uh, what is the purpose of these. Okay, so for a certain number of K iterations, which we also set, we can set the student uh, um, model to be the same from, uh, as the teacher. And while we are, uh, the algorithm is not converged, we do the following things. First, we sample uh, data, again, as we've done before. We sample uh, a new time step, which is only uh, in, the, um, in the range of the allowed steps as the, um, the, the student model can uh, get. And then we sample some noise again, similar to the original algorithm. We, know, we, noise, we add noise to the data the same as we've seen before. And now we perform two denoising steps 
using the teacher model. How is this done? We can see that this, this is where it's done. Um, if you look closely, you can see that the um, well, formula here is the same as the, uh, as the regular update rule of the DDIM. We pass the noise image to the denoiser of the teacher, uh, and then we get the, I'm sorry again, we get the, the noise uh, of the same uh, time step, and then we use our hyperparameters to generate the next uh, XT, and then we pass that XT along again and do another denoising step. We pass it along again, uh, get the, the prediction for X0, we get the prediction for the noise at time step T tag, and then we, param uh, we, we use the hyperparameters of the scale to scale it to be the next noise image. And then we do some sort of uh, weird uh, average, which I'll explain later, and we set that as the target. The average is between the new predicted image XT double tag and XT and the hyperparameters, and that is set to be the target of our uh, um, student. The, and then we do some sort of, and then we again try to have our student user try to uh, receive the same noise image at time t and have it uh, predict the noise image that the, the, the teacher would have predicted having done two denoising steps. And after having done that, we set the student to become the new teacher, just as we've seen before. We have the number of training steps um, um, that will be used in the next uh, student model. And we perform the algorithm again and again until we reach a number of sampling steps in the denoise, in, in the student model that we are satisfied with. Okay, so now I will go into detail as to what is this weird uh, average? What is this formula? That was the progressive distillation algorithm. And then we see how they uh, parameterize the model to predict correctly what is needed. Okay. Um, standard diffusion training, um, the denoising target is the clean data X, okay? And with the progressive distillation training, the denoising target is, is still the clean data X, but predicted by the uh, teacher after two sampling steps. So for the student uh, model to match the prediction of two sampling, two denoising steps of the teacher, we have to make some adjustments to what we are uh, setting as the target. Uh, let us remember what we've just seen, the update rule, okay, of the DDIM is as follows. If we want to advance from sample step, uh, uh, sample step T to some advanced uh, sample step T double tag, the update rule is as we've seen before, okay? So the student wants to match in one step, by performing this, it wants to match what the teacher predicts in two steps, as we've seen in the algorithm. So for the student sampler to match the teacher, we must set this to be equal to what we've seen the, the, the teacher predict in two steps. So uh, we have to set those two to be equal. Uh, we, denote, um, we denote X tilde as, um, we denote X tilde as the target of the, um, of the, uh, sorry, as the, one second. Oh yeah, we denote the student denoising prediction by X tilde and the one step sample that we take uh, by XT, um, T double tag. And then um, the, the XT double tag hat is what we have uh, received from two sampling, two denoising steps of the teacher. And then we set this to be equal to what we would have wanted to achieve with one sampling step. Uh, we uh, input the, the, the formulas, we do some arithmetic, and this is how we uh, receive our, um, our target for the uh, student model. Okay, so that was the model parameterization. In terms of results, they uh, compared their FID score of the new uh, distilled DDIM with other uh, models with different time steps. And we can see that the this is the distilled, the, the thing here in uh, gray green is the FID score of the sampling steps on various data sets on CIFAR, uh, the ImageNet, uh, Elson, and uh, the Church Outdoor. And we see that they can achieve uh, very close FID scores with the distilled models using four sampling steps, the same a regular DDIM would have achieved using 100, 128 and, uh, and other uh, stochastic um, schedulers, sometimes even more. And we can see that it's consistent across various uh, data sets. And they even compare uh, their uh, FID scores using the number of, uh, um, of sample steps to other um, sampling to, to other known diffusion models with uh, different scheduling, uh, denoising um, uh, schedules. And they see that their FID score is very competitive 
very, very competitive with very small sampling steps compared to other models that also try to decrease the number of sampling steps needed. And which shows that the distillation process can achieve, uh, can distill the number of sampling steps needed with very high, um, uh, with very high, with preserving the performance in a very high fashion. That was the basic overview of the paper. Uh, and Mickey, do we have time for future work? Let's keep it for a different time. Okay, so uh, I will skip over and basically, uh, if anyone has questions. Questions, uh, please. Questions? Wonderful, thank you very much, Ofek. Thank you. Okay, Tom, please go ahead. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tom and I'm going to present to you today the paper a mask diffusion transformer with a strong image synthesizer. Uh, the paper was published by uh, a researchers from a CAI lab in Nankai University uh, from China and was presented on ICCV 2023. Uh, so here's the agenda for today. Uh, we'll talk uh, briefly about the introduction, about the uh, background uh, for the paper, uh, some about uh, the motivation for the paper. Uh, we'll dive into the uh, model itself and we'll summarize with the results and the conclusions. Um, Okay, so uh, the mask uh, diffusion transformer is a diffusion model um, based on the DDPM, uh, which we saw in class. Uh, two interesting things about it is that it uses a, a transformer to implement the denoiser uh, in the backward uh, process of the diffusion. And it uh, introduces a new latent masking uh, scheme that aims to uh, help the model learn uh, relations between different parts of the image. Uh, we'll see later exactly what it means and uh, how it's been done. And but, uh, one more thing that uh, it's important to say that the paper focuses mainly on the architecture of the model uh, rather than uh, proposing new theory. Uh, so this presentation will be more uh, technical in its nature. Um, so uh, transformers, uh, I'm sure, most of you are familiar with it, but uh, I will say a few words. Uh, so this uh, architecture of uh, neural networks uh, introduced by uh, Google researchers, and uh, it was orig originally meant for uh, NLP problems uh, and really became the de facto standard today for NLP tasks. Uh, but recently it started to become more uh, widely spread in the uh, computer vision field as well. Uh, it uses an uh, encoder uh, decoder architecture. Uh, here on the left hand side, you can see the encoder. On the right hand side, you can see the decoder. And the main key in this uh, architecture is the attention layer. Uh, so uh, attention uh, mechanism uh, was designed to uh, identify correlation between uh, tokens within some uh, sequence. So uh, in NLP tasks, uh, token is uh, one word and uh, usually, and sequence can be a sentence or uh, multiple sentences. Uh, here in this example, uh, we have a sequence of uh, four tokens, and we calculate the uh, the attention uh, vector for uh, for the second uh, token, uh, meaning that we calculate for uh, each uh, for the second token the uh, uh, its relation uh, regarding all the other tokens in the sec in the sentence. So we'll have here a, a vector of uh, weights with a, a weight for each uh, other token. And this be, this is being done for uh, every token in the, in the sequence. So now moving to a vision transformer, uh, or VIT. Uh, it's another model presented by uh, Google uh, researchers. Uh, and it's uh, one of the first models that uh, uses transformers in vision tasks. Uh, it achieved very, very good results compared to convolutional networks uh, that were the standard in uh, computer vision until then. Uh, we can see here uh, in the image that the model uh, breaks down the image to uh, patches and then flatten it to a vector and uses 
uses each uh, patch as a token for the uh, attention layer. And the whole image is the sequence. Uh, so now a diffusion transformer is a diffusion model based on uh, DDPM uh, with a VAT uh, backbone, uh, the same VAT that uh, we saw in the previous slide, uh, that, uh, that uh, replaces the, uh, the unit backbone that was uh, very uh, commonly used uh, before. Uh, the model uh, operates in latent space, uh, meaning that the whole diffusion process happens uh, on latent vector, uh, which uh, enhances the performance uh, dramatically because we use, uh, in this example, 32 by 32 by 4 a latent vector instead of uh, 256 by 256 by uh, three channels of the original image. And uh, this model is, was the previous uh, state of the art before the uh, MDT that I am uh, presenting today. And here we have some uh, visualization of how the diffusion uh, process happens uh, in the latent space. Uh, we get the noise, the image after the forward process. Uh, we encode it to a, a latent, which uh, usually, as I said, much smaller than the original image. And then we uh, pass it through a series of uh, denoisers uh, until we get the output. And of course, we need to uh, decode it back to generate, to get the generated uh, image. Uh, so uh, the motivation uh, for the paper, uh, as I mentioned, the, the researchers noticed that uh, diffusion models uh, having a hard time learning relations uh, and the uh, image uh, semantics. Uh, which is uh, therefore expressed in slow uh, and training convergence. Uh, we can see in this uh, example here uh, how the DAT generates an image of a dog uh, that even after a uh, 200K training steps, the, the image is uh, from, from uh, being a, a real dog. I mean, we, we only have one uh, eye and one ear, and we can see it's not a very good looking uh, dog. Uh, so uh, the researchers uh, try to find an architecture that helps the model learn the semantics of the image uh, that it try that it uh, tried to generate. So now moving to uh, MDT, the mask diffusion transformer. Uh, this is the overall framework. Uh, we can see it's uh, relatively simple. Uh, so during uh, training, we get this uh, noise latent. Uh, by a uh, pre-trained uh, pre and uh, fixed uh, VIA encoder uh, after the forward process. Uh, I will just mention that this image is a little uh, misleading because this is not a clear image of a dog. It's uh, a latent uh, after a forward uh, noising process. So it's, uh, it's not, uh, we can't really tell that it's a dog uh, in this uh, stage. Uh, so uh, during training, we uh, Petify it and um, masking it uh, using a random uh, mask. Every patch is randomly masked with some fixed uh, ratio. Then it's uh, passed to the, this uh, unit, which we will talk in the next uh, slide. And we get the uh, a latent uh, output, which we compare to the output of uh, another uh, fixed uh, VAE encoder for the supervision task. Uh, this is done. Uh, for training and for inference, we just uh, pass the petrify the full latent without masking to this unit again. We get a latent output and feed it to the uh, decoder and get the generated image. And once again, this uh, VAE encoder and decoder are uh, all pre trained and kept fixed during the whole uh, process. So here is a more uh, <laughs> more accurate uh, picture of the whole uh, process. Um, yes, yeah, so after uh, this uh, preliminary uh, process of uh, petrifying masking, we feed this mask latent to the uh, encoder here, uh, which only handles the unmasked tokens, as you can see here, uh, just for a better performance. And then the output of the encoder is fed to the silent interpolator. Uh, which is this 
uh, unit. Uh, then we uh, reconstruct the latent uh, with the mask uh, that we saved from the from before. Uh, we had positional embedding, and now the key here is that we are we have a small network that predicts the uh, unmask uh, the sorry predicts the mask uh, tokens from the unmasked ones. Uh, so we get a full. Uh, it's uh, again I would uh, just mention this is not an image; it's, it's a full latent without uh, masking. Then we uh, here we have uh, some shortcut that uh, discards the tokens that were predicted for unmasked tokens, uh, meaning that here uh, if we have an unmasked token, so here we will get in the same uh, corresponding place a predicted token, but uh, we want to use just the original one and not the predicted one. And uh, this is done to ensure that this unit, the side interpolator, only focuses on the representation learning instead of the reconstruction of the image. Uh, so this output of the side interpolator is fed to the decoder, um, which uh, gives us, uh, again, a latent uh, output. And we can compare it to the output of the encoder uh, over the ground truth image. And uh, during uh, inference, we remove this uh, whole uh, side interpolator and we just feed the full latent to the encoder. We add a positional embedding, which we, was learned during the uh, training, uh, feed it to the decoder, getting uh, output latent. And then uh, we can decode it using the VAE decoder and get our, our uh, generated image. Uh, okay, so another uh, improvement that the paper suggests is regarding uh, classifier-free guidance. Um, we've seen uh, in class the formula, which is similar to this one for the arrow. And uh, this is the original arrow. Uh, this is the class conditional arrow, and WT is some uh, scaling factor. Uh, so the paper suggests that uh, instead of uh, fixing W, uh, we would uh, dynamically schedule it using the following function, uh, where uh, W is the maximum value for the scaling factor, um, which is some uh, hyperparameter. S is another uh, hyperparameter. Uh, in the paper, they chose S equals four, which uh, corresponds to the pink uh, line here. Uh, and we can see that uh, for the first, uh, for the first half of the, of the process, we use uh, WT close to zero, uh, which means that we already only refer to the this uh, left term. Uh, and this means that we will get more uh, diverse uh, images. And uh, as we get closer to the end of the process, we increase the scaling factor, uh, which helps get uh, better quality images, uh, essentially. Uh, okay, so we can talk about the results now. Uh, the paper uh, focuses mainly on uh, comparison to uh, DIT, which, uh, as I mentioned, was the state of the art uh, prior to it. Uh, so here we can see a comparison uh, over the small uh, models of both MDT and DIT. Uh, so we can see that the MDT achieves uh, similar results to uh, DIT in a uh, three times uh, faster in both uh, training steps and uh, training uh, time. Uh, and of course, as we continue the training, it achieves even better results. And another example for it, uh, if you recall this uh, previous example of DIT, you can see a comparison to MDT that uh, generates the similar uh, image. You can see here that even after a uh, 100k uh, images, we get a, a dog with uh, two eyes. And it's very similar to the image we get uh, after 300k uh, uh, training steps of uh, D80. Uh, so again, we see uh, about uh, three times faster in training uh, convergence. And uh, also compared to other uh, models, we can see that MDT is doing uh, far better in all the metrics. 
uh, here the minus G stands for uh, guidance. So we can see that the model with the with the classifier free guidance achieved the best uh, FID score. Uh, okay, so MDTV2, uh, the model uh, I presented uh, until now was uh, MDTV1, uh, you can say. And this is the original model that was uh, presented in uh, ICCV23. Uh, but after that, the author uh, continued the, the work and uh, improved the model even further. Um, so this is a continuation of the same paper. Uh, it includes some uh, architectural changes uh, compared to the original uh, MDT, but uh, I would not uh, get into it uh, in details. Uh, we can just uh, see the results uh, of MDT v2 compared to MDT v1 compared to DIT. You can see that MDT v2, uh, the small version, is uh, five times faster than the first version. Uh, and also the uh, version with the guidance uh, achieved the even better FID score than uh, version uh, one of MDT. Uh, this is a benchmark over uh, ImageNet uh, 256 by 256 uh, data set. You can see here that MDTV2 uh, is currently the state of the art model of the, over this uh, data set with the MDTV1 uh, not far back. Here is a DIT for a reference somewhere here. Uh, so uh, we can summarize the conclusions. The architecture uh, presented uh, aims to improve the cont contextual uh, learning of the image semantics. Uh, it uses uh, an effective masked uh, latent modeling scheme. And the experience showed that it really uh, delivers uh, much better results in terms of both uh, image quality and training time and becomes the new state of the art uh, on the ImageNet uh, dataset. And here you have some uh, examples of images uh, generated with the uh, MDT V1. Uh, so that's it. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Questions? Okay. Can you highlight uh, one change that was added to V2? Uh, or is it only architectural? Yes, so uh, it's uh, it's only uh, architectural uh, changes. I wrote here uh, some of them, okay. like uh, shortcuts in the encoder, the coder, or uh, different uh, optimizer, but nothing. Uh, I mean, no uh, new theory or uh, something like just that. Just technical. It's, yes. Second. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. So hi. Uh, my name is Ziv, and I will be presenting a refining generative process with discriminator guidance in score-based diffusion models uh, by a group of uh, South Korean researchers from uh, KAIST, which is the uh, South Korean equivalent of the Technion. Um, in this paper, the authors propose a method for refining an existing score-based diffusion model that is uh, pre-trained as score-based diffusion model uh, using a separately trained uh, discriminator. Um, uh, this was given uh, as an oral presentation in ICML 2023. Uh, so let's define our goal. Uh, we're given a pre-trained score model, uh, S of theta, that allows us to sample from the distribution of three images, uh, P of X. Uh, now, uh, given this model, we would, like, uh, we would like to find a method that would refine or improve the, the, the pre-trained model itself uh, without changing it without changing it. And we also want that, uh, that, that method to be cheap, uh, cheap to train and cheap to uh, use uh, in inference. Uh, now, before we dive into uh, how this is done, uh, I'd like to give you a sneak peek to what we're going to get. Uh, ADM, uh, which was mentioned early in the uh, earlier presentation, uh, is our pre-trained model. Um, and ADM GPT is the refined model, the cheaply refined model. It's refined uh, because we get much better uh, image uh, quality. Uh, and I will explain in the next slides uh, what cheaply means. 
Now for the motivation, uh, training a new score model is expensive. It's expensive in both data and in compute. Um, thus, it's common to use pre-trained models uh, for different downstream tasks. Now this makes the question, uh, how do we improve an existing pre-trained score model an interesting one? Um, one straightforward suggestion would be to further train the score model. However, literature suggests that this is not a good answer. Uh, Training it for further uh, epochs would, uh, would lead us to overfit and memoriza memorization. Uh, that is, instead of generating images, the score model would just uh, sample them from the uh, training data set. Now, uh, besides, we also want a method that is uh, not model specific, and uh, it could be applicable to any architecture or implementation. Uh, for example, the previous, uh, the previous lecture discussed uh, transformers as the backbone instead of units. And if we were to devise a method that would improve uh, units, it would become obsolete once the diffusion backbone is replaced with new technology. Uh, now this, uh, this is where uh, discriminator guidance uh, comes in. Um, so let's talk about what this is. Uh, let's begin with a small recap. Uh, this uh, this SDE we have seen for many times, maybe using uh, some different uh, some uh, some different namings, but this is the backward process uh, that we've seen in uh, diffusion models throughout the course. Um, uh, so once I just wanted to make sure that we're all uh, we're all on the same page regarding the names, and uh, let's dive into the model. Now, obvious that this is a quite a math heavy paper, so I won't get into too much uh, rigor in the proofs, but I'll try to give some basic intuition for why is it right. Um, so what is discriminator guidance? Uh, discriminator guidance is a reformulation of the reverse process uh, that we have using the given score model S of data. Uh, I'll now show how this added term uh, become, is actually a discriminator. So, uh, we begin with a pre-trained uh, pre score model that estimates our score function. Uh, as this is an estimation, the, the quality sign here is not true. It's only an estimation. However, we can say that there exists some distribution that we're going to call P of theta, such that the, uh, the pre-trained score model actually samples from it. That is, it actually models its uh, score function. Uh, now, equipped with, uh, with P of theta, we can rewrite uh, our score function by adding and subtraction, subtracting the, uh, the, score, uh, the score function for uh, P of theta. And by applying uh, the gradient linearity and logarithm rules, we get this uh, density ratio log. Um, uh, and we can use uh, S of theta to rewrite it. And we get this uh, equality. We can now plug it back to our SDE and get the new formulation. Uh, now, those of you who are familiar with GANs uh, probably have recognized this term as a discriminator. Um, now, it's quite um, out of scope, and we also don't have the time for explaining why is this a discriminator. Uh, but if you're curious, you can ask the agent of your choice for a short explanation. It's not really that complicated. Um, with Gans mentioned, I think that uh, at this point, uh, the differences between discriminator guidance and Gans might, might be a little vague, so we'll try to give the main differences. So first, uh, in Gans, the generator and discriminator are trained simultaneously, uh, while in discriminator guidance, we train the discriminator after the score model or our generator, if you'd like, uh, has been trained and separately. Uh, second, uh, in GANs, the discriminator role is to improve the generator during training, and it does not take any part in the generation process at all. Uh, however, as we've seen uh, in the new reverse process formulation, uh, in discriminator guidance, the discriminator is taking active part in the uh, 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 generative process. Um, with that established, let's discuss a bit the training. Uh, so before going over the training procedure, I would like to give the main points. So as, as we know, P of theta of X is not accessible, uh, but we can sample from it using S theta that we have. 
uh, we will use that to construct a data set that our discriminator will be trained on. Uh, during training, we will use both uh, true data and the generated samples, uh, uh, and the discriminator will be asked to classify whether a diffuse sample is fake or true. Um, I'd like to emphasize that as data that was given will remain unchanged and will only be used to generate the fake samples uh, to train the discriminator, which is a shallow unit that is a much smaller uh, network than the uh, score model that we'll get. As for the, uh, the training procedure itself, uh, we're given the real image data set. That is uh, probably the uh, data set that our score model was trained on. We have the generated data set that we constructed uh, using this, the pre-trained score model and an initialized discriminator network with parameters phi. And now with each iteration, uh, we will construct a batch that is 50% true data and 50% generated data. And we will denoise it uh, as we usually do. Uh, next, the discriminator is asked to classify whether a diffuse sample was originated in the true or generated data set, and we'll calculate the, uh, the loss based on these predictions using binary cross entropy. Uh, we back up and update our parameters. Uh, with this established, uh, let's discuss this sampling. Um, so uh, it's quite straightforward and expected, I think. It's uh, at each time point, uh, we're given the diffused uh, XT. Now, along with evaluating it by our score model, we evaluate it by our uh, our discriminator, and we plug in the results uh, per the SDE we devised earlier, along with a scaling term, uh, which we need to discuss now. Uh, so, scaling is a concept that we've encountered in a guided diffusion for uh, for classifier guidance. Um, in this figure, uh, we see we see an experiment on uh, ImageNet with a fixed uh, discriminator, discriminator that was already trained. Um, notice only that the uh, graphs are plotted on two different scales. Um, this this result highlights the the uh, the meaning of the scale with relation to the quality diversity trade off uh, that was touched uh, throughout the course. We see that there's a sweet spot here where the <clears throat> recall is quite high, relatively high, and we get the lowest FID as we can. Thus, this is probably uh, the scale that we're going to use. Um, so I've touched earlier on the cheapness of it all, and uh, we'll now discuss the computation budget uh, to see what cheap means. Um, so this is the table that we saw in the sneak peek. Um, ADM here achieves uh, mediocre results for after uh, two and a half trillions activations during training of this score model as of data. Now, um, our discriminator, uh, ADM uh, GPP here, uh, only requires 100 million uh, activations of S of theta to construct the uh, fake data set uh, it will use to train, and a and, uh, and couple of dozens of millions of activations of our uh, discriminator network, which is, I remind you, uh, much smaller. And we get a huge improvement in, uh, in our uh, uh, performance. Um, uh, while it would have been better if the authors would have compared the results uh, with, uh, with the pre-trained score model that was given uh, the same computational budget, um, but we can see that the discriminator guidance used a, a few orders of magnitude uh, less compute in order to train uh, in order to train and achieve far superior results. Um, let's go over some uh, interesting experiments. Um, so on the left hand on the left side, the graph shows the performance of the method using different loss functions at discriminator training time. So uh, we have here an unbounded fullback library, uh, a, a, some variation of least squares and the binary cross entropy. And we can see that, uh, as, as we, we can expect, as this was the chosen loss, um, that it performs best, the uh, cross entropy. On the right-hand side, uh, we have an interesting experience uh, that the authors conducted, uh, where the discriminator guidance formulation uh, we've devised earlier is used to train the model from scratch uh, here. 
uh, instead of training the discriminator separately after uh, after the base model has been pre-trained, uh, that we see in the green graph. Um, while it does uh, get improved results compared to the baseline, uh, we, when we use it to train it from scratch, the, 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 the model, uh, we see that the fine tune that is the separately trained uh, discriminator uh, achieves uh, better results. And now for some more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, qualitative uh, results. Um, here we can see a comparison of uh, the ADM model, the base ADM model, ADM with uh, classifier guidance, and ADM with classifier and discriminator guidance. Uh, now, uh, discriminator guidance uh, mitigates the mode collapse issue that classifier guidance had, as we've seen in the previous uh, previous lectures to mine. Um, we can see that in the improved recall score, and we can uh, that reflects the the overall diversity, better diversity that the model presents. Uh, we can see, for example, for the penguins. Uh, here we have mostly uh, mostly close-ups and of, of one penguins, but here we can see uh, photos of larger groups. Uh, this is also evident, for example, for the burgers, uh, where also where we get also uh, mainly uh, close-ups. But for the discriminator guided version, we get a higher diversity, entire meal, we get some chips, uh, which is quite nice. Um, the the image um, the image uh, quality here is also improved, obviously compared to the base model, but uh, uh, also to the uh, classifier guided one. Um, more more results like this are on different uh, uh, categories and uh, uh, classes of of ImageNet. Uh, this is a found this is a falcon class, and this is the elephant class. The model achieved uh, state-of-the-art performance, at least uh, per 2023, uh, on many uh, ImageNet uh, classes. Uh, as for uh, different models, as I said, uh, this uh, this method is as agnostic to the model, uh, the base model that it is applied to. Uh, here we see two different data sets and two different base models. Uh, this is soft truncation with discriminator guidance on CELEB A, and this is EDM with this accumulator guidance and not uh, on, on FHQ. Uh, this goes to show uh, that this method is really uh, independent of the model uh, beneath. Um, next, I'm going to see it show a result uh, of the different task altogether. Uh, this is the uh, image to image uh, translation task. Here we have the SD edit model that uh, we've touched on in uh, course and previous lectures. Uh, our source uh, class here is cats, and our destinations are dogs. Now, uh, call me an ableist, but dogs tend to have eyes. This one doesn't have eyes in the original model. This one doesn't have eyes in the original model. And uh, if we plug in uh, discriminator guidance for this model, uh, he gets his size back, and he also get uh, this dog gets another nose, but I guess uh, no model can be perfect. Uh, so I did try to uh, uh, to uh, do it all fast. It really got a bit fast, but that's okay, I guess. Um, so in conclusion, we've introduced discriminator guidance for diffusion models. This is a theoretically founded method uh, that is cheap to train, negligible inference. It's very flexible and independent of the base model beneath it. Um, then thank you, and uh, if you have any questions, I would gladly have answer. Thank you. Questions. Questions? Okay.